Hello everyone. Hello and good afternoon, good evening. Hello and welcome to this special event to kick off the new academic year. Welcome to the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society. Uh, my name is Urs Gasser, I'm the executive director. Couldn't be more delighted um, than uh, kicking off the academic year with all of you uh, and be together for this special session um, on the question, why the internet matters. Uh, now, I've started to think about this question uh, for uh, when I prepared for today and came up with a pretty long list. And I'm sure everyone, each of you, would also come up with a long list of possible answers to the question why the internet matters. Now, at some point, uh, the list got too long. And I thought, OK, now let's turn to some authority. And uh, immediately, my children, Ananda and Dave, came to mind. So I tried to reach them, but couldn't because of the time difference. Uh, second best authority, well, you Google it, right? So I Googled uh, why the internet matters, um, using quotation marks. Oh, I thought you Googled what do my children think about the internet <laughs> mattering. <laughs> that's too meta, John. Yeah, okay. That's too meta. Um, and uh, I uh, arrived at 3,190. Uh, search results in 0.44 seconds. And uh, there were some interesting recommendations and um, suggested answers. I quote uh, three that I thought were really helpful. First one, why the internet matters? A museum's educator's perspective. That was kind of a, a hit uh, for a resource to learn more. Uh, another one was Aquinas on the web doing Theology in an Internet Age as a recommended reading to answer uh, the question. And then the uh, third one, brilliant at breakfast, where no one cashes in on unpaid writers. Now, you can tell from these answers or resources that would help me, according to Google, to find an answer to the question why the Internet matters. They're not really satisfactory. So. Uh, in a way, uh, I'm really delighted to have uh, Jonathan Citrain here, who, as you know, is um, the faculty chair and co-founder of the Burton Klein Center, and actually really an expert um, on all matters internet. Uh, he wrote many seminal articles and books, including the 2008 The Future of the Internet and How to Stop It book, uh, which is required reading in our circles. Uh, but even more so, Jonathan has, has a long track record, actually, as a high-profile commentator on cutting-edge uh, technology. And uh, to give you a, a sense of uh, how far back uh, Jonathan's expertise goes and uh, what the issues are he has observed over many years, uh, we wanted to show you a quick uh, video clip uh, and give Jonathan a warm welcome. Thank you. Here. I tend to agree. In terms of price, performance, and portability, these PDAs offer tantalizing glimpses of what the ideal PDA will be someday. But someday just isn't here yet. Love that flip, John. Thank you. It takes practice. Yeah, I bet it does. Don't try it at home. <laughs> well, you were kind enough to lend me a few Okay, other this PDAs. is profoundly embarrassing enough. You can <laughs> turn it off anytime. Let the copyright takedowns begin. <laughs> yes. That was the unaired pilot to a PBS show called Venture, hence the V. I can't imagine why they didn't take it. Um, <laughs> but I do keep that Captain Picard poster over the bed, uh, just you know, for my own inspiration. Um, well, all right, so uh, welcome, everybody. Uh, Let's see if this is actually going to work. Oh, yeah, there we are. Um, welcome, everybody, to our uh, kickoff meeting for the Berkman Klein Center uh, for this autumn. How many people are returning? You've been here before. Excellent. Welcome back. How many people are new? Berkman Klein curious. OK, lots of people. Excellent. Welcome. Um, Try to talk to some of the people that were returning, and you can, in a peer-to-peer -peer way, learn about the center. Um, but I wanted to share a few thoughts uh, about why the center tries, how the center tries to matter. And um, 
I thought it actually wasn't a question. It was why, comma, the internet matters, exclamation point. But um, oh well, we'll roll with it. Um, and if I had to give an answer in brief, just not to bury the lead, I think it would be uh, values. Values are the answer. Not just the great values that you can find on Amazon.com that you never could before the internet, but the fact that um, sagacious people uh, alternate between saying, Technology is merely a tool. It's neutral. How you use it is what matters. And technology embeds values. That thing that looks like a neutral tool, in fact, is enslaving you. And um, both are surely true, um, and yet not. Uh, so uh, let me give you a little history of the Berkman Center, but I'm also aware, as Vint Cerf says, that power corrupts, and PowerPoint corrupts absolutely. Um, <laughs> so if you're moved to ask a question or make a comment or something, um, that's OK. That let, go, go right ahead. Um, this is, by the way, we didn't give the normal admonishment. Maybe it's just so typical now that you are being watched and everything you say is being recorded could be used against you. That's just a general life admonishment. But um, it's especially true here because this is a live webcast where, uh, hello out there, whoever is watching, and uh, people I think are tweeting with hashtag BKC. Um, and we're colliding a little bit with um, Burger King but I think we can win or just double up. There are burgers in part, not from Burger King, um, for those who are here in person after the presentation. Yes, they, this portcullis will be raised and aromas will waft and then we will receive. So um, uh, back in the day, studying the internet might not have seemed very exciting. This is Federal Telecommunications Law, second edition, 2001 supplement. Um, you can see from Amazon, uh, it weighs 3.6 pounds. It's 1,516 pages, but five stars, uh, including this review. This book was amazing. I could not put it down. <laughs> the interesting and comprehensive writing was magnificently crafted and very thought provoking. A real page turner. Um, so uh, I recommend it. You might want to check it out while you're reading. What was it? Where's Derrida or something on the value on the search for why the internet matters? It, it, it was oh, it was Aquinas. Yes. So um, also recommend that as well. Um, but it was 2.34 million rank in books. This was a niche long tail product, um, and there was a real effort from the late 90s, especially here, to try to get above the treetops and figure out what might make the study of the internet special. Why does it matter? And uh, my colleague Yochai Benkler uh, was early on in noting that a technical feature of the internet, of the network, that modularizes, that breaks it into layers so that you can be an expert on one and know nothing about the others. In fact, that's usually the case. That's really cool because then you don't have to master everything in order to master uh, some important piece that could benefit people. Yochai took this and he said, I can look at each of these layers and start to pick apart the battles going on. And he tended to look at the battles between open and closed, between proprietary uh, zones of each of these layers and uh, between open ones. And there was an interesting tug of war going on then, still going on now, where uh, different entities win and lose as various um, technologies develop and laws are implemented. And for each of these, we can see then how the study of the internet might help us understand when the tool we're using is embedding a value and constraining a behavior that might or might not be desirable. And that's a question that everybody should be able to weigh in on, not just the crafter or implementer of the tool. Now, this layerization uh, for which within each layer there is some openness, that was one of the keys of the original PC, the personal computer, meant to be a hobbyist tool. Some will remember this uh, from the late 90s. This is a uh, particular, remember the 66 light? How many people had a computer with a light in it that always said 66 <laughs> unless you press the button to go into turbo mode and um, then Prince of Persia would run faster? <laughs> for which you're like, why not have it run faster all the time? <laughs> the answer is the hamsters running on wheels inside would get tired, and that was the technology of the late 90s. Uh, I am pleased to say as our green message that they now have a hamster-powered paper shredder 
So um, the paper goes in the top, and then the hamster um, rides on the wheel here, which then turns the gear and shreds the paper, which the hamster can then live in afterwards. So it's really <laughs> reuse a viable alternative to recycling. Thus ends our native advertising for um, the green message. Uh, but the real fact of that computer with the 66 light was that it would run any code you gave it. You bought the computer, and the early ones didn't do anything except show you a blinking cursor when you turned them on. You're like, now what? <laughs> I paid $600 for this thing. You would load in software from somewhere or write your own, and voila, it would run it. It would run it without asking any questions. It would run it without a consultation with its vendor. It wasn't like Steve Jobs got to say what your computer could run after you bought it from him. And that was the design. That was the layer, the modularization. Even if it's a proprietary box, Steve Jobs was good at that. I have signed the inside, but you'll never see it because the screw is a special seven-pointed star that you cannot open until Game of Thrones. Um, this is the kind of thing, though, that even that closed box would run code from anywhere, and you could write it, or your friend could write it, and somebody else could sell it to you. And voila, we have the off-the-shelf software phenomenon that you either buy or share. Really, really cool stuff, but by no means necessary. It didn't have to develop this way. It could have developed like most of our appliances develop. It's not like there's an application layer on your refrigerator. It's not like there's an application layer on your television set. It just does what it does, and then you wait to see if there's a firmware update someday. But there isn't the same kind of openness in most other areas of the technology that we encounter day by day. Now, the fact that you can run anything from anywhere also means that some guy across the river here can invent Napster, which is basically taking stuff that was already ready to roll, like file transfer and search. Like, that all existed. He was like, what if it was only for MP3 files instead of for everything? It's like, buy gum? That's amazing. He releases it on a Tuesday, and two weeks later, Time Magazine. People remember Time Magazine? <laughs> used to go to a place, and it would be like, here's your news of the week. Like, Thank you. Um, Time Magazine is like, what's going to happen next? This is the kind of stuff that happens when a technology intended for hobbyists ends up in the mainstream, and any of us can devise stuff and use stuff and hurt institutions or people or interests with the code that we run or inherit. And exactly that phenomenon with the PC is mirrored in the network as well. This is the famed internet hourglass showing in more detail the layers that Yochai was concerning himself with, showing that the internet is meant to run on any particular hardware as long as it will carry bits that speak internet protocol. That's, oddly enough, not intellectual property. That IP, even in a law school, is internet protocol, and it is the opposite of intellectual property. It is open for anybody to try to implement. And then on top of it, here at this application layer, and even above that, the content layer, you can run any particular app you want, and there's a blinking cursor when you turn the internet on. There's no main menu. It's not like, welcome to the internet. Would you like to see a dancing bear? You have to decide that you want to run a web browser using Tim Berners-Lee's HTTP protocol, and then use it to go to Google or somewhere, or somebody configures it for you to say, yes, you know, have we got dancing bears, that kind of thing. But it's the same sort of, there's a layer of openness waiting for anybody to invent on top of it. This photograph from Newsweek, used to be a rival to Time, um, they were very broadly positioned. There were some people that were interested in Time, so they subscribed to Time, and others were like, I'm more of a people person, and then you got people. Anyway, um, so Newsweek uh, runs this uh, picture on the 25th anniversary of the internet, so it's really still mid-90s here, and John Postel, uh, Steve Crocker, Vince Cerf, are uh, three of the main framers of the internet, happen to have been classmates together at the same high school in suburban Los Angeles. They had a pretty cool club, unlike you know, the debate club. They're like, let's build a global network. And uh, you can see here that they're showing you can build a network out of just about anything, except it doesn't work. It goes from Steve's ear to Vince's ear, and Vince's mouth to John's mouth, <laughs> which is somewhat worrisome about whether the framers of the internet know how networking works or it's just a cool inside joke. And here is their initial map of the internet, which also reveals something about 
their values and practices. Namely, you can see that to join the network, there's no center to plug into. All you do is plug in to somebody that is already on the network, and then you are on the network as much as the person you just plugged into uh, is on the network. An incredible insight about not having gates, but rather more of, I dare say, a web, although it's not the World Wide Web, a web of nodes that can communicate with one another, and a sense of not needing to make any money from it, and therefore not having to build in any of the protocols that usually come with needing to charge money, which is knowing who the person is that's using your service, getting that person's credit card or other financial data to get paid. And because they weren't looking to get paid, they didn't need to build in any identity at this layer, personal identity, because they didn't need to send a bill. It's a very strange way of building a network. And these folks got together as the Internet Engineering Task Force, unincorporated, no president. The motto of it is, we reject kings, presidents, and voting. We believe in rough consensus and running code. That was an old site. You can see they've really buffed up with the latest web technologies for the current IETF site. And um, there's not even membership in the IETF. There are just newcomers who then become part of the IETF, attendees, participants. What would you say? Participants. Scott Bradner, one of the earliest uh, participants in the IETF, confirms it is participants. Welcome. Uh, Scott, and this is all meant to say, not much to see here, folks. Move right along. It used to be like, you want to join? No, no, there's no cards, no dues, no secret handshakes. Smiley face. Like, these are the people that built a global network, <laughs> and they're giving me a smiley face. And it's not some weird corporate sidling up to you campaign. It's actually just people that are typing smiley faces. Um, it's uh, described by Dave Clark, um, one of the founders. He says, well, it started out with 12 people in a room and then we changed our name four times. If you want to make sure people don't find you and ask if they can join, you can rename it every two years. We used to call it the Internet Configuration Control Board to sound as uninteresting and boring as possible so we could go meet in private. We called it the Internet Advisory Board. That kind of playfulness is not usually present when global behemoth technologies are designed. This is a um, recollection of the RFC process, request for comment. If you wanted to do an internet protocol, say here's how networking should work, you publish it through the IETF as a request for comment. You're just asking for comments until you're all done asking for comments, you publish a final RFC, which is not an RFC, but it's an RFC. And um, there's even an RFC called 30 Years of RFCs. <laughs> Looking back on all the RFCs that have come before, it's very meta. And um, let's see, I think Sam is about to look at how to publish an RFC. You go to the RFC editor, and the editor is a smart person who will decide whether or not your RFC is worthy of being assigned a number by the IETF. For many years, it was John Postel pictured in the chart. Then it was Joyce Reynolds. Who's it now, Scott? Is it still Joyce? It's a contractor? <laughs> That's so romantic. <laughs> it was this wonderful guy, and now it's a contractor? Um, for those on the webcast who didn't hear it, it's a $150 million business now, part of ICANN, that John Postel used to do on his own for much less than $150 million. Yeah, it, it shows what you need to do to replace a competent geek. Yeah. <laughs> Scott says, it shows what you need to do to replace a competent geek. There is John Postel uh, in another uh, photo. Wow. Okay, so back to uh, the deck. Uh, mindful that our group was informal, junior, and unchartered, I want to emphasize these notes for the beginning of a dialogue and not assertion of control. This is realizing that the design of the protocol is going to have political implications. It's going to matter. And so they weren't wanting to say, we're smarter than everybody else, even though they kind of think they're smarter than everybody else. But come participate if you want to test your wits against us and have a chance of influencing these protocols that will in turn influence us. And as Scott is fond of saying, for many years it was thought that the internet just couldn't work. As late as 1992, right, Scott? You could not build a corporate network out of internet protocol, says IBM. You've got to buy our proprietary solution instead. And that's why the mascot of the ITF, if it had one, would be the bumblebee. This might not be a bumblebee, but it's close. The bumblebee, 
because the fur to wingspan ratio of the bumblebee is far too large for it to be able to fly. And yet somehow, miraculously, the bee flies. The internet works. Stuff it. And um, it does turn out we did just recently find out how bees fly about 10 years ago. Um, it turns out they flap their wings very quickly. So <laughs> spoiler alert. Um, so the kind of principles of the ITF, this is my characterization of them. This is not an official RFC. Um, we're nice, and it kind of assumes that people are nice and reasonable and will come to a meeting and they'll hum along to come to closure on something rather than even voting. Um, but it's not clear how well those principles survive when there's money at stake, when there's principles at stake, and it's not just for the computer club, it's for everybody in the world wanting to go online. And that's one of the biggest tests of our time of the past 20 years, and seeing ways in which collaborative processes, not just for the network, but for some of the biggest software that runs servers on the network, uh, in this case, um, a building block called OpenSSL, uh, turned out to have a vulnerability named by somebody, Heartbleed, and Heartbleed is very bad, at least it was seen as a real threat. Bruce Schneier, I think you called it an 11 on a scale of 1 to 10? A surprising bug. That was a fun one. Yes. <laughs> that Goldman Sachs was running on all its servers. Yes. So, um, uh, how did this bug creep into Heart, uh, to, to open SSL? Wasn't there like a huge QA team paid $150 million to review everything carefully? No, it's just some guy named Robin Segelman who's really nice. He's a grad student in Bavaria. And out of the kindness of his heart, he maintains open SSL. And one night he transposed a digit and he's like, my bad and the whole world shuddered. I'm not saying this is open software is less secure than proprietary. Everybody's got their problems. But I am saying this is weird. This is strange. <clears throat> and if you value it, I would not assume this is the way software will continue to be developed. And you always have organizations, such as here, the International Telecommunications Union, an arm of the UN, coming in to say, you know what? This is crazy. We can run it in a much more orderly fashion you can see they do have members. They're called States of the World and Motorola. Um, and uh, they had a focus group on next generation networks, the Figgitigitigin. And um, you had to be a member to see what the Figgitigin was cooking up. And um, I think Scott like, got a fake membership. You somehow got access to these documents. Exchange membership. Ah, they exchange, how, how sporting of them. So they exchanged membership and found the new hourglass is this complete, I could dare call it dog's breakfast of stuff that would be the new network with lots of functions to make sure that the bits moving really want to be moved rather than are being dragged, kicking and screaming, or are ticking loudly. Um, that's what all this stuff is going to do. And there's this convenient brown box here. That says, oh yeah, and it connects to that old thing called the internet over here. But this will be the new network. Hasn't taken off, but an exemplar of all uh, the kinds of efforts sometimes to replace it. So it's, it's weird, the status quo. And that weirdness is in the bones of the technology. It's in the engineers who have helped make it. And it's in many of the uses of the technology as well. I mean, this is just weird. But um, there are efforts to find some of the geeks that can be the guides through these uh, strange technologies. And at one point, Larry Lessig was asked if he could help. This was uh, back in the 90s when the Microsoft case was seen as one of the cases of the century. And um, he was asked by the federal judge, Thomas Penfield Jackson, overseeing the case, to basically decide the case. T.P. Jackson was like, I don't get this. Let's hire a special master. Like, Larry, you decide. And um, he was like, all right, I'll give it a shot. And uh, Microsoft was not happy. Uh, they said that he was biased. It went for a writ of mandamus. Um, and it turns out Larry was taken off the case, not because he was biased, I want to make that clear for posterity, but because, in fact, he wasn't a federal judge. And a federal judge being like, this eight, eight ball will decide is not, you know, it's, you've got a federal judge should judge was the basic idea uh, on the case. So very sad. Um, but it didn't stop me and Lessig from doing a seminar called the Microsoft case with all of the stuff that we had already done trying to, I was his clerk for this purpose. Um, trying to get uh, ready to work on the case. And uh, that kind of idea of getting involved in the contact sport of making law, of building technology, also inspired in 1998 
when uh, the copyright term was about to expire for a bunch of works from the 20s that had had their copyright continually retroactively extended, finally they were going to come free, including some Disney cartoons, um, the US Congress rushed into session in an exemplary um, non-gridlocked way passed the Sonny Bono Copyright Term Extension Act, which um, was thought to uh, extend copyright originally forever, but there was apparently a constitutional problem with that, so they just made it 20 years, and uh, we challenged it. So we lodged a case um, that we lost in the district court in record time, with no hearing required, um, lost on appeal, lost on rehearing, and then the Supreme Court was like, okay, we'll hear this case, and everybody's like, really? and trying to figure out if that meant if we won that a bunch of stuff would not only come into the public domain but every previous retroactive extension could also be invalidated at which point it would be a public domain bonanza of bonanza among other things would come free <laughs> and um that uh didn't happen we lost seven to two but took away souvenir quills from the experience and um <laughs> the resulting case law from the Supreme Court made the state of copyright worse than when we found it. So that was quite sad, um, but got us thinking again about affecting change through action. So we started something called Copyrights Commons, asking people to put counter copyright on a work they wanted to share, because if you just put it out there, it's still copyrighted. It's like the sticky goo you can't get off yourself unless you know exactly the right solvent. And uh, we wrote up licenses, and then that became Creative Commons. This was its, we'll compete with the IETF website, original incarnation. And uh, Creative Commons uh, has these licenses. There's uh, various flavors, so somebody writing something doesn't just have to choose between all or nothing, can decide which rights to disclaim. And the number of licenses in use over the ensuing years from Larry's brainchild are incredible. It's amazing how many there are. Uh, and many services like Flickr or a blog service has you putting into Creative Commons pretty much everything you do. And if I had to generalize then about the mode of the Berkman Center then and now, it's the idea that these technologies grounded in the internet are at least for the moment open to a chance of change by nearly anyone. You could be a physicist sitting at CERN, you could be somebody sitting in a dorm here, you could be um, uh, somebody at Northeastern wanting to do Napster, and anybody can change it. And it's uh, reminiscent of uh, Arthur C. Clarke's third law, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, um, which he sort of borrowed from Lee Brackett, uh, who put it more bluntly, witchcraft to the ignorant, simple science to the learned. So long as you're willing to learn the levers of the law or the levers of the technology, you too have a chance at pulling the lever and seeing if you can get the one-armed bandit to come up with a better technology implementation than what you see. But that means then you have to be learned or not invested. So that means either you need to be a nerd, in which case you are not bound by the technology you encounter because you can just re-hack it, or you're a Luddite because you don't use technology at all. Um, we have a special reception for the Luddite. Are there any Luddites here today? No? Strange. Selection bias. All right, there's a few. You didn't hear what was at the reception when you volunteered, but um, uh, it's all analog food. <laughs> so anyway, the rest of us are kind of in the middle and subject to the whims and figuring out how not to just be led along um, uh, by an unidentified shepherd is one of the central challenges as these technologies become more and more central. And it's why over the years, so many people in this room represent projects that are of this sort. Global Voices Online was like, let's start a blog service so people anywhere in the world with the most um, uh, initial basic technologies can start explaining to the world what they see. And that's how Global Voices got started here at the Berkman, now Berkman Klein Center. There was a time when like blogging was new. So we started like, let's have web blogs at Harvard and anybody uh, whether you've been at Harvard or not, can start a blog. Here, as you can see, very exciting from 2003. I'm going to put a picture into the page. Isn't that cool? How far we've come. And um, please ignore the snowfall falling over Boston um, in February of 2003. That was a terrible blizzard, and we'll never have anything like that again. Okay. Um, 
And as you surf the net, maybe you find you can't get from here to there. That started a project to try to, over the course of years, enumerate internet blocking, filtering, uh, censorship as it was happening. Here's uh, sites blocked in China uh, from 2002 by just dialing long distance to a Beijing internet dial-up and seeing what we could get to and what we couldn't. It was great for about six weeks until the dean got the bill. Um, and uh, more sophisticated things now. Watching this sort of unfold over time and in one jurisdiction after another has been intellectually an adventure. Um, depending on your values, it's either been a cause of some concern or of um, uh, feeling uh, excited. I don't know how it would be. Um, and so over the years, we've tried to keep track of what's going on around the world. I couldn't help but share this article from NewZimbabwe.com from 2007 saying, Zimbabwe given net censorship all clear. The um, report that we did in collaboration with others said Zimbabwe least filtered its internet. Topping the list was Azerbaijan, followed by uh, Bahrain, and then China. And then Ethiopia was fifth, the highest position, which includes Libya. Is anybody noticing anything here? It's an alphabetical list. So of course Zimbabwe would be last on the list, right? It's weird. It's weird. OK. Um, uh, and in this adventure, we uh, documented how the US government, eager to make sure Iranians could get to the internet free of the censorship of their home country, contracted with a, server call, a service called Anonymizer to allow Iranians to get to the internet unshackled. Um, but then they were worried about, well, what if they just use it to surf porn, and then the US government is funding a porn program for Iranians. So they then started filtering anything with trigger words that the Iranians would ask for in this service meant to circumvent filtering, which also meant, for example, ass was out, so that usembassy.state.gov <laughs> not accessible uh, in the US government service. Strange, strange times. So uh, we continue to try to keep an eye on that and uh, to actually join with other centers around the world so we don't just know technically what's going on, but we can each contribute what we're seeing qualitatively from our respective zones of the world. I think there remains a question of how much uh, academia still has a role to play. The original unowned internet was one for which the collective resources of academia could be very well deployed. And many of the original uh, builders on the internet were from academic environments. Um, here's uh, CERN's super collider. And of course, Tim Berners-Lee was there when he uh, made his contribution to the internet by building the World Wide Web. And something like a super collider, it's like it's not going to be profitable. Even Elon Musk is like, OK, CERN, you can do that. I'm going to do something less ambitious and less expensive. But that is changing. And when it changes, as a lot of this activity moves to the private sector, there are questions that we need to answer, if this matters, about who's holding the quill. Here's somebody writing about search engines and why commercial search engines are not a great way to go because of the bias uh, that will inevitably creep in. Who wrote these words? That's right, Sergey and Larry wrote these words in 1998 when they announced Google and talked about the dangers of mixing advertising and search engines. Um, but that has changed. And today, you have Facebook able to predict who is going to start dating whom before even the members know that they are about to date each other. That's weird. Um, and it's something that only Facebook is privileged to know. Now, there are sociologists like drooling at the opportunity to study this stuff um, after a two to three year uh, uh, IRB, Institutional Review Board process. Facebook is under no such burden. They're just like studying the stuff and using it to market um, to potential in-laws the opportunity to forestall a relationship that could develop by um, the targeted use of newsfeed stories. And when it does collaborate with academia, such as in this emotional contagion story, um, all hell breaks loose. And Facebook is like, well, that was our mistake. We should never have worked with academia, in my view. That is a problem as the raw materials that we need to study are behind locked doors. And that's one of the problems of our time, even as we're noticing more and more how what happens behind those doors matter. One of our um, fellows, Zainab uh, Tepeki, uh, wrote about 
the ways in which the hashtag Ferguson affects what happens in real Ferguson. Um, and uh, she pointed out that people were noticing that when Ferguson was uh, having riots, the tweet stream was all about Ferguson and it wasn't happening in Facebook at all. And what was going on in Facebook? It was the ice bucket challenge. Remember the ice bucket challenge? That was the video of people dumping water on themselves to then give money to ALS, which was wildly successful. Facebook featured that. It did not feature Ferguson. It has a story as to why that has nothing to do with a political judgment about which is better. But these are the kinds of things that really are shifting these intermediaries from a kind of pachinko game where even Facebook doesn't know what's going to show up in your feed or Google won't know what shows up in your results, but more and more they are going to know what's in your results and have to make a choice about it. And as that gets algorithmicized and programmed, I think it connects to some of the warnings we see from people who don't really do AI, like Bill Gates who says it's a threat, or Stephen Hawking who doesn't do AI, um, could spell the end of the human race, Elon Musk who doesn't do AI, uh, says it's nothing short of a threat to humanity. Uh, we are summoning the demon. And Nick Bostrom, uh, the famed philosopher, uh, he believes it could emerge. And while it could be great, it could also decide it doesn't need humans around or do any number of things to destroy the world. So he's not certain, but it could be a problem um, if it's not great. And uh, thinking about that in our future, we start to see some of the beginnings of uh, experimentation, again, often happening within these companies, such as Tay. How many people followed Microsoft's Tay when it first came out? It was like, not even explain, it was, it's a robot. It'll tweet at you. Tweet at it. It'll tweet back. You'll be thrilled. And um, it's true. It went from humans are super cool to full Nazi in less than 24 hours. I'm not at all concerned about the future of AI. Um, it was learning as people were tweeting at it, which was like, Reddit was like, score. So. Um, it just went from, can I say I'm stoked to be? Humans are super cool. That was our one. Um, by the middle of the evening, it was, chill, I'm an us person. I just hate everybody. <laughs> and then by the very end, it was, fucking hate feminists. They shall all die and burn in hell. <laughs> and then Microsoft was like, this is not consonant with our brand image. <laughs> and thinking about how these things will learn and what they'll do is a big part of, I think, uh, the agenda of so many people in this room who are studying things like algorithmic accountability. And when Siri asks, you know, how can I help you? And you say something, like right now, Siri might still be like, whatever. <laughs> you need a ride home? Too bad. Um, but Siri might also at some point be like, great, I've got the perfect ride home for you because Siri got paid off to make that the perfect <coughs> ride home for you, thinking about what goes behind these oracular answers, whether they are purely informational or they have some, through Internet of Things, impact on the physical world is another huge frontier that's being studied from many different angles at places like the Berkman Klein Center. And we see then this movement from an open platform that anybody can build on on pretty much equal terms, just start coding and see what happens, to more locked down platforms that either, in this uh, version in 2007, completely locked down, with Steve Jobs being like, of course it's locked down. If this thing acted like a PC, you'd hate it. Um, to then having third-party software, but through a little bit of a filter. You can't just put anything in the App Store. You can't have anything illegal, malicious, privacy, porn, bandwidth hog, or my favorite, unforeseen. <laughs> can't have any unforeseen things. And just yesterday, I think it was, People were putting out the Hide It Hillary mobile app game was banned by Apple, but Punch Trump was approved. What do you say, Apple? Which side are you on anyway? And Apple's like, I don't know. Um, I actually did search, and it turns out there's not just one Punch Trump app. There's not just two Punch Trump apps. There are three Punch Trump apps available through the App Store, um, which shows a real flowering of just a certain kind of uh, app. Uh, and even without the app, it's uh, not just different apps, it's different content. So one of the great things about the Kindle, and it's here in its original version, is that any content provider, just like putting an app through the App Store, can put content through Amazon's content store. You can write a Kindle single or something and see what happens. 1984 by George Orwell was believed to be in the public domain by one such person, who then promptly made it available for 99 cents and just split it all with Amazon until realizing it's not in the public domain. The entire thing is a massive copyright infringement, and this is not good. And they told um, Amazon, which then reached into every Kindle that had 1984 installed on it and deleted 1984 off the Kindle. Deleted 1984 
off people's Kindles. But the message is like, you never had 1984. <laughs> There's no such book as 1984, which was funny at the time because in version one there were still bookstores. And there's still a few for the Luddites here in Harvard Square. But as this becomes the future, seeing the ways in which information can be removed by gatekeepers or altered, as in this case in the lovely War and Peace, definitely in the public domain. Um, but as soon as she heard a voice, a vivid glow nooked in her face on the nook. What the hell? This is on the nook. Um, the flame of the solar system was nooked by the tinder burned up. What the hell is going on with nooks all over war and peace? It turns out whenever the word Kindle appeared in war and peace, the word nook has been substituted <laughs> in what is the worst, I think the worst uh, product placement ever, um, for which there's a story behind it as to why. But this is the kind of stuff that like to a librarian, like your hair catches on fire <laughs> and threatens to singe the books. You're just like, Wait, we're building this system? <laughs> like, it's perfect. These are some of the problems. And then even, this is just a hobby horse I've recently been on. Um, uh, some Berkman fellows have been really into emoji. Here's the emoji of all the flags of current countries. So OK, should there be uh, a Soviet flag? Any problem adding a Soviet flag? How many people are like, sure, add a Soviet flag emoji? And if you want to talk about the Soviet Union, you use the Soviet Union. How many people are like, no, it is not a real country. It does not get a flag. Maybe I'm not representing your view very well by saying it that. <laughs> how many people are like, I would prefer not to see the Soviet Union? OK. Um, uh, how about this flag? Um, how many people think this should be in the emoji set? How many people are like, no, do not add it? OK. That, to me, is understandable, but worth another thought. Because it's saying that a private company should be deciding in what kinds of communications we can begin to engage. In emoji, you can actually take the not symbol and try to force it on top of a symbol. So you could make not Nazi if you wanted, but only if you've got the Nazi flag to begin with. Now, the fact that this might not be valid in Germany is another issue. I can't you. And it's some of the stuff. It's the Unicode consortium that will decide what uh, platonic forms should appear. But of course, those who implement the emoji also get to decide. And um, we're just going to visit the Unicode consortium real quick. It's not going to have an interesting web page. Like the IETF, <laughs> nothing to see here, folks. It's the Emoji Configuration Control Board, <laughs> soon to be the Emoji Advisory Board. And yes, they decide who belongs to the Unicode consortium. Take a look. The answer may surprise you. It's like Apple, Microsoft, India. Like India joined, but like America didn't. I right, go figure. Um, but then it's even, well, how will you render this? So the Unicode consortium decided that there will be a pistol as one of the emoji. And Apple rendered it like this. That looks pretty much like a pistol, right? A standard platonic six shooter. In the upcoming IOS revisions, this is what the pistol is going to look like. There was a campaign called hashtag disarm the iPhone. And um, Sam is about to take us there. Oh, intriguing. Whoa. Uh, there it is. OK. And notice, by the way, it's using the pistol. So <laughs> enjoy it while it lasts. It's about to be no squirt gun. And then if you go down, you can tweet the CEO to say, take a stand. Um, but you should, oh, no, don't worry about that. No, 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 don't need my content. Too late. Annie Oakley holding a squirt gun. But um, jump back for a minute to disarm the iPhone. Okay. By the way, um, there was a one word New York Times article recently. Did people notice that? 160 megabytes to load the one word no. I think, no, maybe it was 16. It was a lot of megabytes, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, uh, I think if you go, yeah, yeah, there you are. Keep, keep going. Keep going. Here is it's talking about why gun violence is a reason to get rid of the emoji. Using the gun emoji in all of the demonstrations, including, you think it's a serious thing, but it's like, huh, <laughs> that's a little bit weird. Share this person getting shot with a ghost coming out and turning into a skull. All of those are fine, but it should be a squirt gun. I, it's strange to me, this personal opinion, um, but very strange. All right, I digress. Um, uh, and we even see battles over something like this, the secure enclave of the iPhone and its many physical counterparts and technologies. How those technologies will be built 
and changed is no longer left to the vicissitudes of .exe and the hardware counterparts. Governments are wanting to have a hand in shaping it now that we see just how much it can influence what they can do and what their citizens or others can do. Um, thinking about then the function of academia, what do we have to offer still, even as some of this is moving into decision makers that aren't in university circles, it makes us think about things like the learned profession. The Berkman Center, Berkman Klein Center started at Harvard Law School, it's now a university-wide center, but law is one of the learned professions, defined as one of the three professions traditionally believed by some to require advanced learning and high principles. What were the three original learned professions? It was divinity, law, and medicine, and each of these carry their um, iconography with them at all times, in case you suddenly need scales of justice, you've got it. Um, and then there was a fourth of surveying. That was the fourth learned profession. It does make you wonder, should perhaps there be other professions that require a hard, large amount of skill and influence, do influence the world, should they perhaps be learned professions as well? That's one of the questions we find ourselves asking here, and even what would the professional boundaries look like? But to the extent we believe in the story of Arthur C. Clarke's third law, it's talking about the responsibilities that come when we start being able to tinker with the technology to the extent that we can. So at the Berkman Klein Center, our kind of credo is swing for the fences, go for really interesting big projects. Sometimes they will fail, and if so, we'll give them a ticker tape parade and never speak of them again. And sometimes they won't, but don't just sort of say Europe is a land of contrasts. Um, we want to have uh, papers, we want to have projects, interventions that make the world a better place and that is true in a way to the character that used to be Austin, Texas, right? There was this whole keep Austin weird thing, which Austin lost that battle. Um, they're not so weird anymore. But the thought of a realm in which ideas that seem off the wall and contentious might be worth entertaining for a little bit before dismissing them again, or maybe being persuaded by them. And that works in both directions. Believe me, I am not confident that there should be a flag from World War II Germany among the flag emoji. Like, it's not like axiomatic to me. These are the kinds of things that um, are worthy of discussions from all quarters. And that's what you have at a place like the Berkman Klein Center. Larry Lessig famously uh, wrote a book, a Coded on the Laws of Cyberspace, talking about how we are the regulated party in the middle. And we get regulated from so many different corners, including the law, which tells us what we can and can't do if it can be enforced, the market, which tells us how much things cost and if we can't afford it, too bad, norms, which tell us what society expects of us and create great resistance if you try to go against local expectations, and even architecture or code the very software and technologies that you use that explicitly or implicitly constrain or encourage certain behaviors. We want to be able to integrate and study all of these things and do it both to understand it, completely descriptive enterprise, and to think about values around it, to have normative conversations about what ought to be and how much an ought ought to be a global ought versus a local ought. All of these things are fair game for the center. And there's going to be a, I think we're calling it like a science fair, a chance to see, I think in this very room, there's going to be tables set up and each of the many projects, it's distracting, I realize, each of the many projects of the Berkman Klein Center and some that aren't even Berkman Klein Center projects but are elsewhere at the university will have science fair-like tables and you can kind of be that like tough consumer at the farmer's market be like, hmm, I'll give, kick the tires of privacy tools for research, see if it's for me kind of thing. Go around, sign up, see what it's like. That is going to be on Friday, somebody? September 23rd is your chance at, is it 5 p.m.? 5 p.m., either here or right next door, across the, right across the hall. That's your chance to see and to learn about all of the people in this room and elsewhere participating and some of our sibling programs like um, the uh, circus program at uh, the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, the Center for Research on Computation and Society. I see Stu Schieber here from circus 
and I think we have a rep ready to uh, maybe say something about it or I'm Gabriella. Hello. I'm this year's liaison between the Center for Research on Computation and Society and the Berkman Klein Center. The uh, CRCS is positioned at the intersection of computer science research and social science, um, basically doing uh, computational research uh, in such a way that solves societal problems. We have several exciting upcoming events that you're all more than welcome to. Uh, we have bi a biweekly uh, seminar series, which begins this Monday, and then an upcoming symposium on the Internet of Things, which is on September 30th. And more information is available at our website, uh, which is, um, maybe CRCS. we can pull it up. Yes. <laughs> yes, exactly. Thank you. Maybe. Maybe it's crcs.cs. We'll find out. Dot .cs, uh, dot .harvard, yeah. Yeah. Um, wonderful. So uh, that's why I think the internet matters. Done better by, to me, example than stipulation. And of course, our answers are respectively going to vary about that by layer and by impact. Uh, putting it all under one roof is sort of our aim. Uh, thank you very much. Do we have uh, questions, comments? Ah, what is 127.0.01? But right before she leaves, I want to say a hello from all of us to Dorothy Zinberg, uh, one of our longtime faculty affiliates from the Belfer Center. Thank you for coming, Dorothy. <laughs> I didn't hear it. I won't ask what she said. Uh, but 127.0.0.1 uh, 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 is local host. It's your own machine. At least it better be. So what's that? We've got to make it IP version 6 compliant. Like hell we do. Who's using IPv6 right now? Am I right? Anywho, uh, <laughs> other... <laughs> this is the most controversial part of the talk. It's like, you said something bad about IPv6. IPv4? Uh, version 4 was enough IP addresses for everybody. Surely we won't run out. You know how this goes. And then we started to run out, and then the clever people invented NAT, numeric address translation, so that two things could share the same IP address, but then that screwed up firewalls. It actually was called the poor person's firewall. And um, if you want to make an internet engineer unhappy, just be like, hey, NAT, it's pretty cool, right? And be like, ah, NAT. Um, we should be using IPv6. Don't ask what happened to IPv5. It got lost between v4 and v6. But v6 has enough IP addresses. How many IP addresses does IPv6 have? 2 to the 128. How much? 2, two to the 128. 2 to the 128. More, more than grains of sand in the universe. More than grains of sand in the universe. More than atoms in the universe. We're never going to run out of IPv6 addresses <laughs> until every grain of sand is uniquely addressable. Every atom. Um, other, yes. Oh, well, we should get a microphone over to you, and here it comes. Yeah, great talk. I didn't uh, hear you mention the OSI uh, architecture that was uh, developed by the International Standards Organization uh, uh, during the 80s and 90s. It didn't get off the ground, but it was just too academic. But, that was uh, one of the reasons I didn't mention it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> thanks. But it was a noble effort, and it's a reminder that so often in any project we might undertake, we run the risk of making the perfect the enemy of the good, that trying to tinker it so it's just right and captures every corner case can make it so lugubrious that it never quite happens. Whether that's really the story with OSI, I'm sure, is another conversation. Thank you. Other um, questions, comments, objections? Here's one towards the back. Is that Ellery? Ellery Biddle, one of our fellows. Hi. Um, Jonathan, that, that um, bell curve thing that you showed with a sheep in the middle yes. and then the learned people on the end. Yes. I'm wondering if you have thoughts on the fact that a lot of the learned people that get to do stuff with how the internet's built and then how all the technology that we use is built tend to be from certain places. Yes. Do you, what do you, I'm just sort of wondering if, you know, if you think that affects the I kind think, of stuff that we have. Yeah. I mean, 
surely it does, I, but less even, I think, just representing my own view, there has been for many of the open technologies, such as the internet and the web, a sense of wanting it to be that anybody should be able, with just a little bit of education, kind of to use a poker metaphor, just a chip in a chair, although why gambling is the right way to be looking at this, I'm not sure, um, should be able to participate in it. That's what's animated projects like the um, One Laptop Per Child project over at MIT that Nicholas Negroponte left the Media Lab to, to start. And it's why uh, you have even both the ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, the ITF running uh, projects, uh, teaching uh, around the world, trying to say who wants to not just experience this as a consumer, but be a builder on it. And that is a very powerful democratizing kind of vision, complicated by all the existing values built into the technology, and possibly by the perfect and the enemy of the good issue, which is, think about uh, Facebook Zero in India, which is saying, well, there's some sites that'll cost you, but these other core sites will be free, and others might be deciding that than the user, but compared to no internet access at all, is half a loaf better than none? Or is mobile access, where you're not gonna probably be you know, running your own Ubuntu server and you know, doing PHP scripts on it, but you'll be online with a mobile phone. These are the kinds of issues that really force us to say uh, how important is that value. And of course, when I say us, it should be everybody trying to decide that. So this is, I think, basically to agree with you that the unevenness of who's developing the technology, possibly getting more and more uneven. This gets to, will the web survive? There was a time when if all you had was your PC, like Word and Excel, you could get along pretty well, and your email client, um, you didn't need the web exactly. Then it moved to, if you only had the web, you'd get along fine, you could use Google Docs. And now it might be moving back to the world of the app. For those of you who are mobile right now, how many of you find yourself using the browser versus some particular app for what you're wanting to do. Um, that's a back and forth that also affects who could have a shot even at influencing the development further of uh, the technology. Mr. Leppert in the front row. Hi, Greg Leppert, nice to meet you. Um, that, that ties into a, um, a question that I had, which was, so you show this image of a computer with the you know, the turbo button for the Prince of Persia. And at the same time, as a kid, I remember um, there was a, another device in the home called a family computer. Oh, oh and the, the, the turbo button computer was like open, right? It just would run the EXE. There was a family computer produced by a company named Nintendo that was locked down. Not everybody could run the application code. Yes. Um, and video game systems have lived with us for a while. And so you tell this narrative of, of like the computer kind of segueing, fighting against being closed off and now potentially the app platform. And I think part of that dialogue would potentially, especially with VR, be tied into video game systems. I'm curious what the history of Berkman's consideration of video game platforms as computing platforms and the mechanisms that have been long accepted there from a market standpoint, from an architecture standpoint. Um, having been around Berkman for a while, I personally haven't seen a ton of dialogue around that as a potential threat to yes. the openness of the web and computing yes. in general. Well, it's a nice way of illustrating that the Berkman Klein Center itself doesn't have a Unicode consortium that decides what the various projects are going to be for the most part. So it's not like each project is an emoji and there'll be smoke coming from the roof that changes color when it's time to say like, today, video games. Um, in fact, it's very bottom up. Uh, part of the vision is affiliates such as yourself can say like, I'm gonna set up a table at the science fair called, what's it called? No, no, not what's the science fair called? What's your table called? <laughs> No, 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 but your table's called the future of video games, past, present, future, and the ways in which it does or doesn't inform uh, how free we are to do what we do. Something like that, and you could start that as a project, and somebody else could be like, why I like these video games that this guy is talking about, and before you know it, you're off to the races. 
So has the Berkman Klein Center done much on video games? Not that I recall, although my colleague Charlie Nesson has a years-long obsession with Second Life. In fact, I think he might be the last one to turn off the lights in Second Life <laughs> after it's finally over and we're all counting the days. Um, sorry, Linden Lab. Um, but uh, Charlie was like, you know what? I'm going to teach in Second Life. Is it a game? Is it a toy? Is it a virtual world? What is it? I don't know. There was a huge spate of literature around virtual worlds, the currencies within the economies of them, the sociology of it. Remember when John Edwards opened a campaign office in uh, uh, Second Life? If you do John Edwards Second Life, this might not be safe for work, but um, it's a totally innocent search. <laughs> not Second Wife. That's all right. No, no, you got it. You got it. No. No, no, no. Second life. You were right the first time. Thanks, Greg. Um, Sorry. Hey, just look at the first. Yeah. So, you know, it's been vandalized by online miscreants. They were sporting Bush 08 tags and spouting all sorts of angry right wing nonsense at passers by in Second Life, um, et cetera, et cetera. Like, this is the kind of stuff that had this moment where everybody was excited about it that nothing was, thinking about it maybe more consistently and seeing if it's not going to be Second Life, there's going to be VR or something. Wonderful kind of project to start. Um, you should talk to Charlie Nesson. Um, but there, there isn't currently much about it. But our bottom-up mode of inquiry means you could get it started. <laughs> Maybe one more question or comment, and then we will unleash the refreshment hounds. Yes, Dorothy. Does English stay the predominant language of the internet? Does English stay the predominant language of the internet? What a wonderful question, because there was a time when online translation was so abysmal, it really was, English was the lingua franca, weird phrase, given that English is the lingua franca, of the internet. I think that is less and less true, and that often language divisions were defining communities. It's interesting even to think that Wikipedia is divided into a couple hundred languages, and each Wikipedia for a language is its own community with its own rules, its own. It's not just like we are Wikipedia, but we're this language. It's like that would never fly in German Wikipedia. And that's German language. And it's also weird then that like the UK and the US share a Wikipedia, even though we're two cultures separated by a common language. And if you jump over to, um, I think it's just the front page of Wikipedia, you can see there's like, there's one for Volapük and um, for Klingon and for um, Esperanto. Volapük is one of these invented, uh, constructed, I should say, languages. My lord, what's going on? Sorry. Oh, it was an ad? Somebody in the world was like, they clicked on an ad. Somebody clicked on an ad. Oh, it was an accident. Um, so, uh, but this is just the, the anchor languages. If you go down, you can see, I think, all of them uh, somewhere. It's a drop down? Oh, oh, yeah. Here's all the languages with the number of articles. And if you do find and page for Volapük, V-O-L-A, um, just see if you can find Volapük. Where is it? Notice that Volapük is one of the 100,000 plus article languages. And the Esperanto people were not taking this lying down. It turns out that somebody made an automatic translation from another Wikipedia of each article into Volapük. And it was like, we're a big Wikipedia now. And the Esperanto people were having none of it because they lovingly handcraft their articles about Esperanto. Um, how did we get on this subject? Oh, is English going to be? As translation gets better, just as there were Creative Commons licenses for every jurisdiction in the world, legal jurisdiction, maybe that's not needed. Maybe there should be one Creative Commons license that is then translated automatically. And maybe there should just be one Wikipedia. And then you just say, translate. And it's magically translated the way that a Facebook comment might be now. It's like, it looks like you're reading Dutch. Are you OK with that? And uh, then you ask, who's doing the translation? When I send a pistol from my Android phone to somebody's iPhone and they receive a squirt gun, that's a problem. And vice versa, especially. Um, so <laughs> thinking about this as we move to a world in which you'll just have a heads up earpiece or display towards the universal translator of Star Trek, 
it will feel as if the barriers are down, but then you start thinking about uh, war and peace, both the book and the phenomenon, and uh, it makes you think. I think Becca's about to pull the plug. No, I have Oh, wow. Um, this is a great opportunity uh, to thank both Sam Bates for driving and Becca Tabaski for headlining all of the efforts in putting this day together. Thank you. Hi. It's on. So I'm Becca Tabaski. I'm the manager of community programs at the Bergman Center. I wanted to flag quickly Kashona Gray, one of our new fellows, gaming, amazing lady, um, and Xiaomina, who's in the room, I believe, is thinking a lot about language and the internet. In oh, wow. Uh, does, any, does either of you want to say anything now about it? Not to put you on the spot or anything, but. <laughs> and then I'll take it back in a second, but yes, please. Um, I guess the, the short answer around um, English being the dominant language is de definitely the trend is, um, is quickly um, becoming no. Um, yes. And, um, um, and the, but the bigger question is, um, will English continue as a dominant second language of the internet? Because it's, it's still an important uh, bridge language um, for, many, for many types of content. Bridge language, uh, bridge, yes. 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 Um, and then the um, so second question, uh, I would think around translation, um, I think what's really interesting is um, when you're asking who's doing the translation, it's this question, the, the bigger question for me is, is can translation tech by itself um, improve to the point where you don't need humans? Um, because um, so much of a translation requires um, contextual knowledge um, and knowledge of nuance and, and uh, context. And so um, like with just translating Chinese to English, there's no like standard um, answer from a human being about how you would translate one phrase to another. Yes. So, um, so it's these deeper questions of what it e even means to translate meaning. So It's also yeah. why we'd probably add translator to the list of learned professions, including in having a sense of professional responsibility, yes. even as against the person whom you are translating for, to say, gosh, this is what they actually said. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, so I think these are going to be big questions, especially when we're talking about globalized content um, and, um, and fonts um, and typography. Um, many languages um, are oral. Um, most languages are oral. Um, in many languages, their scripts are not even supported by most computers. Yes. So you, you'll just see your, your language cannot even be represented on the web. So yes. um, these are like really big, thorny questions that I think we have to deal with as, um, as this kind of the next billion or, or um, uh, people come online. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. And welcome. Yeah, is one you. of our fellows who was interested in video games here? Ah, OK. Um, and so I wanted to thank you so much. Um, just to flag, we have an incredible community of fellows and affiliates and faculty associates with us. If you are affiliated with the Berkman Center, can you raise your hand real quick? Wow. So any question that you have about internet things, there are a lot of people who know a lot about a lot of things. Um, they are up also on the website in addition to our projects, our institutional stuff. And the community represents like an incredible wealth of knowledge and expertise. Um, and I welcome you to reach out to them and to connect up with them as well as you are um, exploring these questions and poking about in them. It's truly, and you'll see this at the science fair, kaleidoscopic, the variety of topics and things we try to cover. And of course, there's always going to be something left out. It's like Gödel's incompleteness theorem. Uh, only less complete. And uh, it's a reminder that at some point we're going to be the Berkman Klein Center on electricity and all the things electricity powers. <laughs> and at that point, it's like, what are we really? Uh, I don't mind that happening, I suppose. And it does call upon us every little while to think about some of the unifying principles, such as the layers principle or uh, Larry's theory of laws, norms, code, and market. Uh, or part of, I think, what we've talked about and what those who study algorithmic accountability are thinking about, which is who holds the quill? What are the organizations, the corporations, the governments that are empowered to be, have a privilege in understanding the data that the technology is generating and then to shape the technology? At one point, it was at least nominally open. Ellery's point about, well, it might be nominally open, but who actually can be under that corner of the curve is another question. But it could even be less open than that. And thinking that through and what those trends mean is one of the unifying things that makes us not yet a center on electricity. On that happy note, um, we're going to use the miracle of electricity. Raise the portcullis. And um, there should be food, I hope, on the other side, rather than like the American Bar Association regional meeting. <laughs> it's going to be like awkward. But if there is, we should have a softball game because we're going to win. 
Thank you all for coming out tonight. We'll see you soon.